start the session. Um, I'm Gail Hughes, and I'm the coordinator for the book club. Bob Flax will also help to introduce things, and David Gallup will be the guest um, moderator for the, the session. And he and Bob also will give some short presentations during the session. So who do we have now? Um, Carla and Tom Hastings and Lee Davis and Ron Glossop, Donna, David Gallup, Dave Otten, Bob Reinhold, Bob Fleck, myself. Um, Bob, are you new to the book club? Um, I heard you chatting with others, but I'm not sure. I, I suppose so. I, I, I think I attended one session uh, maybe six months ago or something like that. Oh, OK. Yes, I think that if the book club was in existence six months ago, I attended a session. Oh, great. And yeah. where are you from? St. Louis. Oh, oh. OK, so you're in Ron's group. Uh, yes, I'm in Ron's group. If he, if, he, if he considers me in his group. Ron and Dave Watton. He's very great. particular about who he's, he considers in his group, but he <laughs> might consider me in his group. I'm not sure. <laughs> and Carla May. Oh, Carla is in the St. Louis group also? Right, right, yeah. Terrific. Well, I want to draw your attention to the, um, I prepared um, an agenda, which was attached to the message that I sent to you. So um, this is the third and final discussion of the Lee Davis book. Gary, no. The Gary, Gary Davis, Davis book. <laughs> He got the wrong Davis. Gary, <laughs> Gary Davis book. My country is the world. And um, we will be, in addition to finishing our discussion of that, um, selecting the next several books that we'll be discussing later on, setting the date for the next session. And OK, so the first item on the agenda is to round out the picture of who Gary Davis was and why his actions are important to consider for today's World Federation and World Citizenship Movements, David will share anecdotes about Gary and highlight some of the trailblazing actions that Gary took over the years from the 1960s onward. He sent um, an attachment which I forwarded to you guys, so you should have that, I hope. So Dave, do you want to take it away? Sure. So I'm going to start sharing my screen if I have that capability as a moderator here. Bob, Bob you need to make him a co-host. Sure, You're sure. the host. I can't yep, do yep. it. OK, hold on a minute. I'll push a magic button or two, and you can share away, David. Hold on a second. Make a co-host. Uh, make co-host. OK, share away. Excellent. So. Um, just to let you know, I will be sharing and unsharing my screen several times throughout this the conversation uh, today. Um, hopefully, that won't be too distracting. But it's you know some of the points. There'll be slides that I'd like you to take a look at, where I'll continue talking over the slides, so to speak, and then other times where it'll just be me talking with you or conversing with you, telling you anecdotes and stories about Gary. So let me just start sharing though, and I'll do that right now. Okay. Okay, here we go. David, can I jump in to just make a Wait, comment? Please. Yeah. So, so just to let everybody know or to remind people who are on, on the call in the past is that the first two, two sessions we had essentially focused on the book. So what David's going to do today is talk about the stuff that was not in the book, things that happened before some issues of you know Gary Davis's childhood and work that he did after what's in the book. So that's kind of what we're focusing on today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Back was, to you, I, David. <laughs> I was just actually just about to say that. <laughs> oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> no, that's OK. So as you can see, and you should have gotten this in the email, there's a list of, of anecdotes and, and actions. I don't know whether we'll get through all of these, but some of them are really literally just a minute or two sort of discussion about these things. Others 
are longer. And then of course, all of you will have a chance in between some of these uh, stories to give a comment in particular uh, and potentially uh, a question. Comments probably better than questions because of course questions might lead to, to me speaking more and, and maybe you'll have had enough of me <laughs> by the end of the next 50 or so minutes. So anyway. And I uh, wonder if I could ask you a question. Uh, what was the years that he lived? Yeah, from 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 1921 to 2013. So he, he died uh, just when he was, uh, I guess, do I need to admit Arthur? I, if I'm in charge, do I need to admit people? No, I got it. You got it, okay. Donna and I have it. Okay, yeah. good, okay. Um, so yeah, he died literally uh, like three days before his 92nd birthday. And we'll, we'll get to that near the end of my, of my comments with you today. So um, Gary, we've read for the last, a few sessions we read My Country is the World, Gary's memoir, his, his first book. Um, and that was really only the beginning of his exploits and his actions to promote world citizenship and respect for universal rights. Uh, you've read his book and you've probably seen The World is My Country and Arthur and Melanie, the producers and director of the film uh, are here also. Uh, so you know that uh, you, you know, you know what happened during the film and how he explained the, the heady years of, of 1948 through the early 1950s. But you probably don't know what came before that, and you may not know what came after that. Um, so I'd like to share, as I've said, some anecdotes and actions of Gary's. Um, and in between each section, as we've said, will be time for two or three brief comments from all of you. Uh, so two of the most significant actions that Gary took were to found a government of, by, and for the people of the world, uh, a world citizen government, and then to create an administrative agency that would act as a functioning government for, especially for stateless people and refugees and undocumented people around the world. Oh, let me see, why is this not moving forward? Oh, there, okay. Um, so in 1953, Gary founded a world citizen government um, and he gave a speech about it called the Ellsworth Declaration. And there is a picture of Gary in front of Ellsworth City Hall in Ellsworth, Maine. Uh, and he talks about that a little bit in the book. And then you can read a portion of the Ellsworth Declaration on uh, the bottom of page 220 of My Country is the World. But Gary also created to really uh, functionalize that government or to implement it the administrative agency or the administrative branch, which is World Service Authority. And he founded that several months later at the beginning of, of 1954. Uh, he founded it in New York uh, where he was living at the time. And he actually called it the United World Service Authority, simply si similar to uh, the Fe World Federalists, which were the United World Federalists. Um, uh, but he would tell me later on that he decided to drop the word United, the word, I'm sorry, the word United uh, in front of the word world. Uh, because he felt that that was redundant. The world is already um, one, uh, and it's just us humans who haven't yet acknowledged that fact. So now I'd like to start uh, telling you a little bit more about uh, how I first met Gary Davis, uh, and the story will begin to elucidate who Gary was, how he viewed the world, and what kind of actions he took to actually change the world. So, um, Right after I was uh, uh, 26 years old, right after law school, I was looking for a job. It was 19, uh, 1992, the economy wasn't great. And um, so I was telling everybody I know I knew that I was, needed a law job. Uh, and so I had a friend who worked at the Nature Conservancy and she had a friend uh, uh, who, uh, whose sister used to work at World Service Authority. So the sister told her sister who told my friend that they were looking for a lawyer. So I immediately got in my resume I had an interview with Ingrid Dennison, who was the previous president before me at World Service Authority. And she said, David, I like you, but you really need to meet Gary. Gary's gonna be the person you're really working with. And he's very particular about who he works with. So she's like, here are two books you need to read. And this was a Friday afternoon. Uh, and I was gonna be meeting with Gary downtown at our office on 14th Street uh, that Sunday morning. So literally about a day and a little over a day later, she said, read these two books, My Country's World and Passport to Freedom. She handed them to me and I'm like, oh my God, how am I gonna read these books by Sunday? <laughs> so she handed it to me, I went home to my apartment. My wife said, so did you get the job? And I'm like, well, uh, not yet. I still have to meet the founder. Uh, so uh, it was a Sunday morning 
um, March 1st, 1992. And this is pretty much exactly what Gary looked like <laughs> as I met him in front of our office building uh, in the morning uh, of that morning. So I was waiting for him and, uh, and uh, he, I introduced myself. He's like, oh, okay, yes, uh, come on in. Uh, uh, let's go up to our office on the 11th floor. And, and he looked at me and he said, David, why is your hair so short? I'm like, well, I, I, I felt like, you know, to get a law job, I needed to look a little bit more conservative. Well, Gary said, ha ha, well, you don't have to worry about that. And then what he did is uh, he took a the little scrunchie or hair fastener that held his long flowing locks. Uh, he pulled that hair fastener out of his hair, well, moved his, uh, his long gray flowing locks around and, and said, I think hair is power. <laughs> and he said, so you won't have to worry about that around here. So I was really, really uh, pleased, very happy that, uh, that I could grow my hair back again because I, <laughs> I had just cut it off uh, before that. Uh, so wait, let me let me unshare uh, my screen for a moment. Um, so uh, that was Gary, as you can see, multiple versions of his long hair. <laughs> anyway, so the next thing, uh, next part of this story, as as I'm meeting Gary for the first time, there's always like a, a how, how did you meet Gary and when did you meet him for, for many people. Uh, and um, so we were taking the elevator up to the 11th floor and uh, chatting just a little bit after we talked about our hair. <laughs> and then he, he got it, we got off the elevator. He had this literally this humongous key ring with, I don't know, 50 keys on it, like you'd see a building engineer hold. And he was sort of fumbling for the key to the office. And so I said to him, huh, having to have all those keys is like having to have a passport to get in. And he said, ah, oh, David, you're right. If I never had to have a key again, I would, it would make my life. And, you know, I kind of rue the day that I said that to him because literally, Every time he came down to Washington, D.C., because he lived in Burlington, Vermont, he would never have a key. I would have to make him a key each time because uh, he forgot. Once I actually had to fed him, FedEx him a key to his home in Burlington overnight. I think he stayed at his girlfriend Robin's house you know, one night because he didn't have the key to his house. I had, had to FedEx him the key. So uh, you know, uh, <laughs> that was not something that, that Gary thought was too important was, was the key to get in because he, he always you know, thought he could get in you know, everywhere, wherever you wanted to in any way, in any case. Well, so we spent that rest of the day, that basically that first interview, uh, where he's asking me questions in English and French. He was telling me about Thomas Paine, about the Ninth Amendment, um, telling me about why World Service Authority needed a lawyer. And he challenged my ability to speak French. And of course, uh, as it would ha happen, he said two phrases that I had never heard of in French. He said, les clocheries and mes prises dans l'esprit public. And so I'm like, I don't know what those are. He's like, vous parlez français vraiment? And I said, oui, je parle français. You know, do you really speak French? Like, yes, I, I speak French. It's like, well, um, he told me then that the French government had charged him with two crimes. One, um, uh, le scroquerie, which means swindling. And the other one is méprise dans l'esprit public, confusing the public mind. And the French government really wanted to be able to confiscate the world passport or to stop it from being issued because there were so many people from North Africa who were using the world passport to come into Western Europe and to come into France. Um, so in the end, regarding the swindling charge, the French court decided, look, Gary is basically broke poor. In fact, he was giving away most of the world passports to refugees and stateless persons. He wasn't making any money on it. So they had to drop that charge. But the charge may please don't speak public, confusing the public mind. They, they're like, okay, we have to we have to maintain this charge because one, we're a little bit concerned that the French people won't know the difference between the you know the world passport and the national passport, and we want to stop all these these refugees from from coming. And so they they held that charge up, basically shutting down the office in in uh, a city called Saint Louis uh, in France, right at, right on the Rhine River. So what Gary did was literally. Uh, up and move the office across the Rhine River into Basel, Switzerland, you know, the next week, and then worked out of Basel uh, across the river for, for many, many years. Um, so we had had lunch together. This is still our, my interview with Gary. Um, so it's a story within a story, I guess, here. Finally, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. And he says to me, David, how old are you? Which, of course, if, you, if you're a lawyer, you know, you can't ever ask that question in an interview, but he did anyway. Uh, and I said, well, I'm 26. Uh, and he said, hmm, he, he kind of went like this, rubbed his chin. He's like, that's very interesting. I mean, my age wasn't really interesting, but for him, it was interesting because he was 26 when he gave up his U.S. citizenship, which started him uh, on his path uh, to in the world peace movement. Um, so he's like, well, 
he was reminiscing a little bit in his mind, I could tell. And he's like, well, David, I like you. Why don't you come back tomorrow and we'll see how it goes. So I'm like, okay. So I run home, you know, go back to my apartment. I was like, did you get the job? I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm going to the office tomorrow. <laughs> so the next morning um, I go back into the office and, um, uh, and uh, I'm in my best suit and Gary's like, oh, this is great. You really look like a lawyer. <laughs> so he's like, I'm going to take you around and um, show you off to some friends. And we have, there's other things that we have to do. So wait, now I need to share my screen again. Um, so let me go back. Um, so, uh, so, okay, so I'm, uh, <laughs> we take the elevator down from the 11th floor and, and I'm about to hail a cab uh, outside of the front of the office building. And Gary's like, uh-uh, David, look around the corner. So I looked around the corner of the office building and lo and behold there, um, oops, wait, this isn't working. Oh, there, there we are, um, was Gary's motorcycle. <laughs> and he's like, David, here's a helmet. You're getting on the back of my motorcycle and we're gonna uh, drive around town. Uh, so I'm like, oh God. Uh, and I have to say that, that Gary was a very assertive driver weaving in and out of traffic, challenging all signs and all speed limits. Uh, suffice it to say uh, uh, that I was holding onto the rear of that uh, bicycle, motorcycle for dear life. <laughs> um, Gary actually once told me that um, a police officer, officer was in, in DC was trying to pull him over for speeding. Um, and so he opened his bomber jacket and he showed him his, the badge that he had, you know, stuck in the inside of his leather bomber jacket. He flashed the badge, which is, was his Sovereign Order of World Guards, our World, our World Peace Force badge to the officer. Oh, and the officer was like, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know you were on duty. And of course, Gary got out of any kind of ticket or anything by <laughs> showing his, his World Guards badge. And, and Gary went on his merry way. Um, well, so on this first day, this Monday uh, at World Service Third, my first day there, the first thing we did was to go see Rufus King, who was Gary's, really his first lawyer. Gary met Rufus, and he mentions Rufus in My Country is the World um, back in Paris in 1948, because Rufus came up to Gary and said, you know, can I be your lawyer? In fact, Rufus, and, and not that many people know this, was actually also a world federalist. His son was the, became the chief judge of the DC Superior Court. Um, and was also a, a co-founder of World Service Authority when we opened our office in Washington, D.C. And he was a world federalist. He actually wrote a little pamphlet called Manifesto of Individual Secession into the World Community, which you know, I think is really cool. And we probably need to scan that. I don't know how many copies are of that left. But anyway, our first ride was to see you know, Gary's old pal, Rufus, at his fancy law firm downtown. Uh, so we walked into Rufus's office and Gary yelled out, hey, Ruf, and, and Rufus, you know, and he said, hey, Gary, and they hugged. Um, and Gary's like, well, Rufus, here's my new lawyer, David, but I don't know what to call him. And Rufus, so Rufus asked me what, what I would be doing. And so, and then Rufus said, well, David, you're, you're gonna be the general counsel, that's your title. So um, that's how I figured out what to put on my first business card. <laughs> well, so after that, um, Gary and I uh, zipped around town on his uh, motorcycle, uh, meeting various friends um, and organizations. Uh, we took a quick stop at his favorite salad bar for lunch. Gary was a, a vegetarian, uh, although he did occasionally eat fish. Um, and the last stop on the day was at the Brazilian embassy where he dropped off his world passport to get a visa to go to the Earth Summit, which he actually got. And then he went and we had a booth at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, the first Earth Summit in 1992. And Gary would issue world passports. He would talk about world money and discuss the link between world citizenship and the environment at that, at that summit. And at the end of the day, uh, back at the office, Gary said to me, this was fun. I'm going back up to Burlington, Vermont, though, tomorrow. So you need to call me pretty much let me know what's going on down here. Well, so uh, that conversation, that end of that conversation on that first day was uh, at World Service Authority. It was the beginning of my 22-year conversation with Gary, a conversation that I would have you know, almost every day, at least every weekday of the, of, of the year. Um, and like to many people, Gary was my mentor. He was my guru. He was my friend. Um, every day was a new idea, every day was a challenge to the status quo, and every day was a lesson in, in human rights. Every day was a declaration of what it means to be a world citizen or a human being first and foremost. And as you can see, this is a staff picture. There I am on the, on the far right in my tie that I usually wear, <laughs> and my long hair that I was able to grow back after a year. 
<laughs> um, so now what I'd like to do is, is move on from the sort of the basic intro of how I met Gary to um, other stories about Gary's life uh, that I experienced while uh, either that Gary told me or that I experienced myself working with him over the years. So who was Gary Davis? And so I'd like to, um, before we, we'll, we'll take a break here shortly, but uh, before uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who uh, Gary was as a child. So here's his parents, uh, Meyer Davis and, and Hilda Davis. And if you remember from the film, or and he doesn't explain much about them in the book, but uh, Meyer Davis was a, a, an orchestra leader. He had orchestras all the way down from New York, all the way down to Washington, D.C. Um, and stationed in Philadelphia. His uh, wife, uh, uh, Hilda, as you can see, she was a, you know, an expert pianist. And um, she was also, you know, did a lot of things in, in high society, but giving back to uh, society. Well, so when Gary was born, they weren't sure what to name him. So Gary's father, uh, um, and I mentioned this, and Ron, Ron thought this was interesting in our last conversation that his father was Jewish and his mother was Christian. Um, well, Gary's father, Meyer, wanted to name him Saul, Saul Gareth Davis. But Hilda wasn't so, so sure about that. So she's like, hmm. I think we should just name him S. Gareth Davis. The S being like in Ulysses S. Grant. The S doesn't stand for anything. Um, so what I find uh, interesting actually is that on his birth certificate, it actually does say S. Gareth Davis. But on his death certificate, it actually says Saul Gareth Davis. But I actually think that Saul is, is a great name for Gary because Saul means could mean the sun like the star in our sky or it could mean peace and you know Gary's life maybe going from the S to the Saul in a sense from a person where it didn't mean much to a person where Saul for Gary was he being a peacemaker. But, but in the end, you know, the, like the first day I met him, I, I called him Mr. Davis, like, no, don't call me Mr. Davis, call me Gary. Um, and it, it, so one time he said to me, and he said this a lot, look, I don't care what people say about me as long as they spell my name right, Gary with two R's. And that's why you see the yellow underline uh, under his name. Well, so uh, Gary, uh, and this is a painting of Gary that we need to get, as you can see, there's a rip in it, we need to get this uh, fixed. But um, Gary always found creative ways as, as a, uh, you know, to help people globally and helping to empower themselves to change and improve their lives. And he, as you know, he always challenged the status quo. Even as a young child, Gary devised creative ways to challenge the system. He once told me about how he snuck into a movie theater what he did was everyone was walking out of the theater. And as they were walking out, he and his friends would walk into the theater backwards. So that if you were looking at him, psychologically, you would see the front of him, but you wouldn't necessarily notice that he's walking backwards. So they would walk in backwards really quickly, sneak into a row and, and hide. <laughs> yeah, I told this at Gary's 80th birthday party. He wasn't very happy with me for telling the story, but he gave me a hug afterwards anyway, um, because I guess he was a little bit embarrassed about sneaking into the, to the movie theater. Because he, he, of course he could have easily paid. His parents were, had a lot of, of money. Uh, anyway, I bet though that Gary didn't realize that the little creative ways that he had to sort of deal with, with obstacles or with uh, uh, you know, the, the order that, that was, you know, or the controls that were placed in front of him, that his ability to sort of think quickly or creatively would help him transcend borders and, and, and uh, governments later on in his life. So Gary, uh, uh, as well as his uh, brothers and sisters, they, you know, from a very young age, he caught the acting bug. And of course, you know all about that from, from either the book or certainly watching the film, The World is My Country. Um, and his brothers and sisters would put on shows uh, uh, for people like Jimmy Durante, well-known, you know, actress who would come into his home. And, and it really reminds me of, of you know, the, the, the children in The Sound of Music who would put on little musicals for, for, for you know, for friends. Um, I do have to say, Gary once told me that his parents traveled a lot. Of course, his father being this orchestra leader and his mother being in high society, they were always off, you know, on doing the next gig or, or, or you know, out in public. And so Gary said, well, really my governess, the butler and, and the housekeeper, these were, these were the people who, you know, who were my friends um, because his parents were away. You know, he, he sort of fell in love with them because his parents weren't around that much. Uh, and Gary was a Leo. Uh, that was his, his, uh, his sign. Uh, and he said to me, David, I'm a Leo. Uh, my ego bruises easily. So always compliment me first and then you can make a critique. 
which uh, I definitely did because we worked together on, on our newsletter called World Citizen News. And whenever I had a, a comment or suggestion about it, an article that he was writing, I'd always say, oh, this article is great. And then I would follow it with, and I think you could do this. <laughs> and he always appreciated it. Um, so let me stop sharing. And that is the first part of our conversation, which was sort of Gary's, how I met Gary, his early life. And let me stop and see for a couple minutes if, if anyone has any comments. Bob. Yeah, well, I'll just say, you know, the more I hear about not only Gary, but, you know, our movement as a whole, the more I'm struck by the richness of it all and that we really need to have a project to document all of this kind of a, an oral, uh, oral history project to get all these stories down uh, because it is incredibly rich. So I'm just once again struck by that. Thank you. And people will have to unmute themselves if they have a comment. They were all put on mute. Okay, I saw Tom and then Donna. Tom, you're, you're muted. <laughs> okay, uh, who were all the people in the staff? That was quite a large staff. Were they, uh, did, they, did they meet every day and, or what? Yeah, I mean, at that point, 1992, that was like the height of the work of World Service Authority because the world was coming, uh, you know, sort of falling apart or maybe falling into a higher coherence. The Soviet Union was coming apart uh, and all these countries were uh, not, couldn't even create their own passport yet. China seemed like it was going to become a democracy with the student movement. So we, we were issuing hundreds of, of thousands of documents, you know, every year. So we had a staff of almost 25 people when I, when I first came to World Service Authority. And so, yeah, we were there every day. Wow. 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 Donna? Um, I wondered if you could share some of what Gary would talk about at Rio de Janeiro when he was talking about the relationship between world citizenship and the environment, because that's still something we wanted, a message we want to get out. And I'd like to know what he was saying. Well, probably the best thing to do than me to take too much time to talk about that is to say we have a, another short video that his former girlfriend, Robin Lloyd, uh, produced called A World Citizen in Rio. And it's a whole like 25 minute video that talks about the relationship between humanity and the earth and our link and what humans do and how it impacts the earth. And of course, really, in a really quick nutshell, Gary would say, look, if we see ourselves as world citizens, that means we are part of the world. We are not, we don't own the world. We, the world, in a sense, owns us. We are just stewards of the planet. We are here each for just a short amount of time. And while we're here, we have to protect it, not just for ourselves, but for our you know, future generations. And the only way to do that is to see it holistically, to see it globally. And this is why we're trying to create a, a democratic federation of nations so that we can work together to protect the environment and not work at odds against each other for our own internal needs, you know, pumping out smoke and, and, and pollution you know, to, to expand our economies. That's probably what Gary would say. So you have the, you have the video we can watch? I can, yes. you'll, thanks, you'll share it, thanks. Yes, yeah, you're welcome. Um, and so if we could, I'd like to move on because there's a lot, a lot more stories, but you'll have another chance to, uh, to, to chime in here as we move along. So now I'm gonna turn on my screen for just a moment again. Um, here we go. So um, I like to tell the story about how uh, Gary traveled to Israel and Palestine um, because he thought that, you know, this is a hotbed uh, situation in the world. This is sort of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, you know, this, this one little place on the earth could potentially lead to like a World War III. Um, and it's indicative of, you know, other uh, areas around the world where people are, are are arguing and fighting over land and, and, and other things. And, you know, and Gary, you know, as a bomber pilot, former bomber pilot, he saw this as ridiculous. He could, you know, so basically said, how could we bring um, humans together? Oops, let me see if I can, yeah, there we go. So um, he tried to come up with a plan to stop the fighting and bring people in the Middle East together. And this plan was called the Abraham or Ibrahim Federation. And it was a way to help Israelis, Palestinians and Jordanians create a new country uh, with a new name that they would both share. And so here's another idea of bringing in federation again to, to bring people beyond the, the level of where they're fighting at, right? 
Um, and of course, Abraham or Ibrahim, and, and Dave Otten can tell you about that, you know, was an important ancestor, both to Jews, Muslims, uh, and other religions. So Gary issued these uh, Abraham or Ibrahim Federation cards uh, and sent them to these, these leaders with his proposal uh, to create this federation uh, to the Middle East leaders. Um, and um, so he took a trip uh, to, uh, to Israel and Palestine. And, and on his trip, he actually wanted to go to Amman, Jordan, um, on his way to Khartoum, Sudan. But the uh, Jordanian border agents would not let him cross into Jordan from Israel without a visa in his world passport. And of course, they didn't want to give him a visa. So he asked the border guard, um, and this book, this a World Citizen Holy Land, tells this tells this story. So this is another book that you, you guys might want to uh, ask us to to to, or you could find it on you know Amazon. Um, the 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 board, you know, he asked, he wanted to ask the border guards, you know, look, if I, you know, I'm here, you know, almost in Jordan, I'm at you know your frontier. Uh, if you're not letting me in, then um, I need to know, uh, uh, you know, where does Jordan end? Uh, so he asked this this border guard, this sergeant who was in full military garb. Um, and uh, the, the, gar the guards said to Gary, what do you mean where Jordan ends? And Gary said, well, you, you have said that I can't enter Jordan. So I suppose that means that you must put me out of Jordan. And to do that, we have to find where Jordan ends, don't we? So the sergeant looked at Gary coldly and muttered, Jordan ends in the middle of the bridge. Um, uh, so, um, Gary, so Gary picked up his suitcase that he had, uh, who, you know, probably had his typewriter in there as he always did. Um, and he walked to the middle of the Allenby Bridge between Israel and Jordan. And what did Gary do? He sat down right in the middle on the line between Israel and Jordan, you know, sort of like he did in, in between, you know, France and Germany. Uh, and then, oh my God, the, the border officials on, on each side came running down. Uh, you know, the border, the emigrant uh, officials from, from Jordan and Israel came running down and are like, what are you doing? You can't, you can't be here sitting on the middle of the bridge. Um, and Gary said, why? Well, and one of the border guards like, well, it's starting to get dark and at night there's gunfire. <laughs> and Gary said, well, that's interesting. Uh, during the day, you chaps cooperate with each other to control us civilians. But at night, you shoot at each other? Uh, so the Jordanian and Israeli officials looked at each other puzzled. They, they're like, OK. Um, the, finally, an Israel, one of the Israeli uh, uh, border guards said, look, this is a military area. We cannot be responsible for your safety. So Gary looked up at them and, and smiled because, you know, when you smile that that hopes you hope that that smile will you know, reduce the, the, the anger or the, the uh, enmity. Um, and, but they started to scold him and Gary's like, he went like this and put his hand up to signal th that he had something to say. And he said, look, I am on the middle of the bridge. This is neither Israel nor Jordan. You have no authority over me here. <laughs> this is world <laughs> territory. And if you insist on killing each other by shooting across the bridge, I guess you'll just have to shoot through me. And that's okay because I'm unarmed and I can't shoot back. You see, I'm for world peace. <laughs> and the military officers left. Um, left him on the bridge to get advice because they're like, oh, how do we deal with this guy? We don't know what to do. Well, so finally, an hour later, uh, the Israeli military came literally like they did, you know, taking Gary out of, you know, the, the UN uh, uh, compound and bringing him back into Paris. They, they came onto the Allenby Bridge and this probably took, well, first they tried a couple of guys who didn't really want to do it because they understood what Gary was doing. He was, he was using nonviolence. They couldn't pick him up. Finally, they had to get about eight or 10 guys to pick him up, carry him off, take him into a bus and bring him back in to Israel. Um, so uh, that was that was one of the stories that in my mind shows, you know, Gary's how he, he would deal with with the inan inan inanity of, of, of borders and, and officials who are you know, wearing a uniform and, and forced to play that role of you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, you know, why? Why not challenge that that role? Why not challenge the, the role that they're playing? So, um, well, so now I want to talk about a few people who Gary either worked with or Gary helped. Um, so the first person 
uh, well, well, Gary knew a lot of famous people, actually. He, and some of these are similar people who were also world federalists, like he knew Isaac Asimov, uh, the science fiction writer. He knew Yehudi Menuhin, the, the very well-known, uh, renowned violinist. He knew Peter Ustinov, who was, I think, president of the world federalist movement for a while. He knew Marcel Marceau, the, the, fam the, the only or probably most famous world you know, mime. Uh, um, and he knew Catherine Dunham. Um, and that's just to name a few. Uh, and Catherine Dunham, as you can see here in this slide, she was a, a renowned dancer, a choreographer, an anthropologist. Um, she was actually created her own dance style back in the 1930s. And she, she, gained, she really improved her, her dancing uh, uh, repertoire because she studied dance in the Caribbean and she especially enjoyed her time in Haiti, uh, where she learned just different Caribbean dance styles. She actually later on in life had a home in, in Haiti. Um, well, so she was not only just a dancer but she, and, a, and an educator, she was also a human rights activist. Um, and uh, back in the early 1990s, uh, Haitian refugees were being deported or repatriated despite having risked their lives coming on rickety boats to try to get to the United States. Well, so Catherine Dunham decided that she was gonna go on a hunger strike to help her her fellow humans who happened to be, you know, from, um, from Haiti. She wanted to protest this violation of the right to, um, to asylum. Well, so after a few weeks on the hunger strike, she was getting really frail. Uh, so on the 43rd day, believe it or not, 43 days in, and she, she actually said, uh, I don't think a hunger strike really gets sexy until the 40th day. Um, but so on the 43rd day of the hunger strike, Gary flew into to East St. Louis, where she was living right across the river from all of you who are in St. Louis, uh, she, where she lived. And Gary sat by her bedside to try to convince her that she was more important to the, the refugee rights movement alive rather than dead. So um, Gary actually had some help uh, convincing her to, 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 give, to, to end her, her hunger strike because at the bedside with Gary was Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the president of Haiti, and Jesse Jackson, uh, the well-known reverend and, and former presidential candidate. So, but, you know, uh, uh, and she, she did, she did give up on the hunger strike and wrote a whole statement about how, you know, other, other people could take on the mantle of, of, of you know, uh, promotion of, of refugee rights, um, it, you know, and she, but she would continue to, to write about it and speak out about it. And another event comes to mind um, when I think about Gary's creative approach to bureaucratic obstacles. This event also actually pertains to the uh, President Aristide of Haiti. He had gone into exile. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a military leader named Raul Cedras who, who staged a coup and took over Haiti for a while. Um, let me unshare. Um, and so right before uh, President Aristide returned to Haiti, though, once you know, democracy, you might say, was restored because he was a democratically elected president, the Organization of American States was going to have sort of a farewell meeting for uh, Aristide to, um, to talk about you know, what he planned for Haiti and, and how this was going to go. Well, so Gary was invited actually to give an honorary world passport to Aristide at this event. Um, so we were invited and, and it was a fancy soiree and all. And, um, and uh, uh, so um, just before uh, RSD was finishing speaking, uh, then Gary was going to go up to the podium and, and, and hand him his world passport and say, thank you for, you know, supporting democracy in the world, you know, and Haiti is being part of the world. We, 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 you know, we support you as world citizens. And, but just as RSD finished his speech, uh, some secret service agents pulled him back uh, there was a, like a wooden door and a whole wall of, of wooden panels, sort of a secret door. They pulled him back in and he was sw swooped away behind the, the wooden panel. And Gary looked at me, he's like, what, what's going on? And basically, the, the, you know, the, 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 the organizer then said, oh, thank you everyone for coming. You know, President R.C. needs to get back to Haiti. So um, Gary's like, David, come with me. So we, we run up to this wooden door um, and we knock, on, Gary knocks on the door and he's like, he says, you know, uh, so, so some burly, you know, uh, like secret servant agent, you know, sort of peeks his head out the, out the door and he's like, what do you want? And Gary, Gary's like, well, I've got Aristide's passport here. I've got to give it to him. <laughs> and the burly guard's like, what? You have Aristide's passport? What do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, yeah, it's right here in my hand. So he opened it up, showed the picture of Aristide. He's like, well, you know, Gary's like, you know, I'd like to hand it to him personally. He's like, 
uh, no, I can't let you do that. It's like, yeah, but yes, please, you know, uh, this is, you know, important that he have a passport. And the guard's like, no, I'm not having it. Give it to me. I'll give it to him. And Gary's kind of angry. He's like, well, uh, you know, okay. And then the, basically the door, the wooden door shut. But as you know, uh, Gary, or now you know him a little bit more, literally about 20 feet down the wall, uh, there was another panel. So Gary's like, come with me, David. So we went down we tried to, and Gary was trying to open up that other wooden panel to get behind where our steed went. Uh, and then of course, another secret survey agent came out and said, uh, 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 uh. you know, he's like, who are you? And, and Gary's like, well, you know, we handed him our business cards and he's like, well, no, I can't, I'm sorry. You can't meet our steed. He's already, you know, in the, in the, in the limousine, uh, in the, you know, going back to the airport to go back to, to uh, Haiti. So I was frustrated that, you know, and disappointed really that the organizers didn't let Gary uh, give his speech, give the honorary world passport to Aristide. But, you know, Gary said to me, David, I'm sure I'll get the passport. And besides, I already met Aristide at Catherine Dunham's bedside while she was on her hunger strike. So Gary's unceasing optimism and, and his resoluteness to the cause really always um, impressed me. So now I want to go on and, and tell you, uh, share another story of an undocumented woman um, who Gary helped. So let me share my screen. So this is a story of a woman named Shirley Kermali. Shirley was living in New York and, and worked for the state of New York. One day she decided to go up to Canada to print some Bibles for her church because she could get a, a better rate on printing the Bibles in Canada than she could in New York. So she got on a train, but when she came back in or tried to come back in, the U.S. immigration would not let her back in because the only document she had was her New York State ID, work ID. So she was returned to Canada. And, and then she was imprisoned in Canada as an illegal alien. So she was stuck in Canada for about five months. Um, when her husband had heard about World Service Authority, he contacted us to try to see if we could try to get her released. She was born, uh, Shirley was born in the US Virgin Islands, but she was born out of wedlock and neither her father nor, uh, nor her mother wanted her. So she was given up for adoption and she never had a birth certificate. Um, and the status of being undocumented is, is more common than you think. In fact, about a billion people on, on the planet uh, are undocumented. So Gary and I uh, worked with uh, one of WSA's legal department interns to draft a letter uh, to the prime minister and to other officials in the Canadian government, as well as the secretary general of the UN, the high commissioner for human rights. We demanded that she be re released uh, because she had been detained so long that it had become arbitrary detention. And Gary taught me uh, that it's always important to go to the top, uh, like he did when he wrote to the Queen of England when he was in Brixton prison. And he said, uh, you know, going to the top means that that official will decide everything. All the lower level officials have to wait for that top official to make the, the determination. Gary's guru once told him that a cat can look at a queen, meaning that uh, no one should be afraid to, you know, uh, speak to those in positions of power. Um, so within a week of us writing that letter to the prime minister and other officials, Shirley Kermali was released from prison, but she could not return to the U.S. Um, and so that's when Gary decided to take matters in his own hands. <laughs> so Gary had his own plane, this Navion Rage Master propeller plane, and he decided he would fly into Canada and, and fly Shirley back in. And as you know, every pilot must fly, uh, file a flight plan and, or, and passenger manifest. So Shirley wrote U.S. citizen on, on the paperwork. But when they arrived in Burlington, Vermont from you know, Canada, uh, U.S. immigration immediately detained her. Um, and they actually also confiscated Gary's airplane because they said that charged him for importing a quote unquote illegal alien. And Gary told me later on that he was really angry that he didn't instruct Shirley to write world citizen on the paperwork instead of U.S. citizen because we're all world citizens and that would have put U.S. immigration in a quandary as to what to do. Uh, well, so finally, um, uh, Shirley was detained actually in Maine for about 11 months. We wrote to the president and we wrote to uh, immigration and finally she was released though. Um, Gary thought it was a really good idea to have a world government air force. So not only to help people like refugees or, or undocumented people like Shirley, uh, but that maybe a non-weaponized air force uh, of by and for the people of the world could be a, a wonderful symbol, a tangible symbol of world unity and peace. Um, and then he actually created a brochure that talks about the advantage of it, uh, that you know we could you could drop uh, 
copies of the Declaration of, of Human Rights from the airplane or peace brochures um, that, uh, you know, that it would be unlikely that he would be shot down, at, in, you know, as a peace, you know, if he's st standing, flying in between army or air forces, uh, because pilots would know, because he would have put out a press release ahead of time of why he was flying between opposing forces. Um, and believe it or not, Gary uh, actually um, attempted to sell shares of the world government air force uh, to cover the maintenance costs of the airplane. And he actually offered 20 minute flights uh, to anyone who purchased 10 shares of the uh, ownership in the world government one, as it was called, uh, uh, he would uh, for uh, 10 shares for $10 each. Oops, wait a minute, let me stop my share. Um, so now we have another time to, to for some, some brief comments from, from everyone. And by the way, I'm only about halfway through my comments. So there may be things that I have to cut out, uh, you know, if we're getting too, too long into this. <laughs> But any, any quick any quick comments? Or I can keep going. Maybe I should keep going. <laughs> let, let me just ask you, David. Are you yes. timekeeping, or do you uh, need someone to? I, time I actually need some, I need some help because I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get through everything. But which is okay. okay. So we're, we're roughly halfway through the entire session, right. just to let you know. Yeah, and we need to save ten or fifteen minutes at least to decide the next book and Bob for you to provide your presentation. So, right. um, so I'll 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 move on and and we'll just leave some things out. Okay, we'll, we'll tell you when we have about a half hour to go. How's that? Okay, that's perfect. That's great. Okay. So not many people know this, but Gary actually had a U.S. passport for a time, even after he had given up his U.S. citizenship. He only had it for about a year, uh, but he, and he handed it back in at one time when he was flying back into a U.S. Uh, airport. But the reason he got that passport was because he was angry that the, that Every time that he had to fly in and out of the U.S., he would get some newbie, some immigration officer who wouldn't know his story, wouldn't know who he was or what he was doing, and that he was a you know, peace activist. And then he would have to wait. He might miss his flight. And he was trying to avoid all of that. So basically, he, he decided uh, you know, he was going to uh, reach out to the Department of Justice, send him his, uh, his world passport. He sent it to Janet Reno with a letter saying, you know, I want a permanent visa for, for coming and going out of the country. Um, and uh, we never heard back, uh, you know, we wrote several times. So finally came, Gary came down to Washington. We went down to the Department of Justice, Gary and I, we actually entered, we showed our world passports, my, my new one and Gary's reissued, our replacement one. And we said, we were here to see Janet Reno. Uh, and, the, and then they're like, why? And he's like, well, Janet, Gary's like, Janet Reno has my passport, <laughs> which is true. They, you know, they, the Department of Justice had his world passport. Well, we waited and waited several hours and they finally said, look, you cannot, you cannot wait for her. You should have made an appointment. Um, so finally they said, look, you know, we found out a few weeks later, they said that they sent his passport to the Department of State. So we wrote to the Department of State. They said, no, we, we, we did have it, but we sent it back to the Department of Justice. Then we wrote back to them and the Department of Justice said, no, sorry, we don't know where it is. So I think it's probably hidden in some deep secret archive in some, some government basement somewhere. Um, anyway, so Gary actually did have a US passport, but simply because he was able to have it, he had a US birth certificate, so he was able to apply for one by mail. But that never happened again. Um, but Gary also, of course, the majority of his life, he had uh, uh, the um, world passport and that's what he traveled on. Um, and here are pictures of us at the Hague Appeal for Peace Conference, which was the largest world peace conference ever. And Gary and I would attend many conferences together. And, and at, the, at a booth, what he would do is sometimes people would come and challenge the validity of his world passport. And so this one time, this one man came up and said, you know, I really don't think this world passport is such a good idea, whatever. So Gary's like, let me see your national passport. And the fellow was like, why? And he's like, well, just let me see it. So the guy was sort of intrigued. He, hand, he took out, you know, out of his, his, uh, his pocket, his, his national passport, handed it to Gary. And Gary proceeded to throw the guy's passport in the trash can behind him. <laughs> and the guy's like, wait, no, what are you doing? <laughs> you, you, can't, uh, you can't throw my passport. I, I need that. Uh, and so Gary smiled and said to the guy, well, oh, I thought you didn't think passports were, are important. <laughs> and, Gary, and the man's like, he looked worried. So Gary took the passport out of the trash can and Gary explained to this man that because of borders that, that we've been brainwashed to accept, people must carry a piece of paper to exercise their rights. But we should be able to exercise our rights as humans, not based upon a piece of paper. Uh, a document doesn't give us rights, we're, we're born with them. Um, and so Gary said, many people don't have the ability to get a national passport and therefore cannot exercise the rights as this man could. 
uh, how could this be fair? How could this be equal justice? So then the, the man realized that the, the world passport was actually a useful tool. And, and Gary would always have things to say to, to border guards, you know, they're using their bureaucratic language. Like if they said this isn't valid, as you can see on the top of page two, you know, he would say, well, look at the, that the, the page. Does this say, you know, this says this passport's uh, valid in all countries unless otherwise restricted. Do you see any restrictions stamped in here? And of course there wasn't. Or uh, do you, it says, uh, you know, the, another border guard say, well, I'm not going to accept this. And Gary's like, well, this document, I signed it, right? And then he was pointing to the part which says this document is not valid unless it is signed. Well, I signed it, so it must be valid. So, you know, people would ask him, well, how do you get this passport? He's like, well, I work for the government that issues it. Um, so border officials would say, we don't recognize it. But Gary would say, well, I do. Because the border officials think that that ends the conversation. But Gary's like, no, their no is really the beginning of the conversation. So does your passport work? Well, does a hammer work? It just, like any tool, it just sits on the table and lets you know how to work. You have to know that you have rights um, and that you can claim them. Well, so now I'd like to share a, a couple of quick stories about Gary as the lawyer. Um, and uh, so um, Gary wasn't a lawyer, <laughs> but he was one of the best lawyers that I know. And that's because of the necessity that he had to know the law uh, because of his stateless situation and to be able to oftentimes by heart recite the law uh, to officials uh, who were stepping in his way. And of course, be him being an actor, his memorization skills were really important. And Gary would always talk about the Ninth Amendment, which states the enumeration of rights in the Constitution shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, meaning we the people have rights. Gary would go into international law conferences and ask lawyers, you know, I'll give anybody $100 if you can name me, the, you know, tell me the Ninth Amendment. And he never had to give $100 because no lawyer ever knew. But it's really important, the Ninth Amendment, because it says that we the people determine what our rights are. And one of those uh, uh, rights is to um, claim our own allegiance beyond the nation state, because we can determine what our rights are. But Gary, you know, in addition to being sort of a, knowing about the law, he, he was sort of his own lawyer and he did a lot of legal research and, and honed his argumentation skills to draft his own legal briefs. Um, and this book uh, called Gary Davis Goes to Court, Gary tells about five different cases. The first three, which I will only briefly mention really were just to identify himself as a world citizen and to travel freely without needing a visa. In the end, uh, even though he took it all the way up to the Supreme Court, where it was denied writ of certiorari and remanded to the uh, uh, appeals court, they said that he could legally uh, promote world citizenship and world government, but that you know if he's here, US officials could still control him at frontiers. Anyway, the next two cases, uh, and let me unshare, are were probably a lot more important really to humanity. Um, Gary filed a case before the International Court of Justice to sue Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev as war criminals for pointing nuclear weapons at us. Uh, Gary claimed that he, as a world citizen, was a state into himself. The ICJ said, no, we only hear from nation states, not from individuals, so that was not accepted. But he was delighted that the International Criminal Court uh, was created, and that was the next court that he went to, and he filed a petition against the nine nuclear weapons heads of state. Gary argued that there is a crime against humanity because that's one of the crimes that the court says it will hear. Uh, and if, hum if humanity must be then a legal entity and it requires legal protection. In fact, if humanity is the plaintiff, humanity can't lose. And if it can, we're all goners, right? So in his petition, he said that uh, the nation state is violating our right to exist by, by perpetuating war. And law must be consistent with our human status, which is world law. And I have to say the court, even though we know that they received our petition because we got the return receipt, they didn't want to answer the petition. That's because we put them in a quandary. If the court determined that nuclear weapons were legal, the court would then be negating their judicial requirement to adjudicate cases, uh, adjudicate cases about crimes against humanity. If they determined that nuclear weapons are illegal, the court would negate the ultimate sovereignty of the nation state to which the court was itself beholden. And anyway, nu the nuclear weapon states would probably ignore it. Um, Gary, and I won't go into this, but Gary had a lot of frustration about how people use terms like states having rights to wage wars. Um, well, no, states don't have rights, only, only people do. And, and, and oftentimes the state use their powers against us with impunity. Um, also, Gary, uh, oh, let me share really quick. Um, Gary, in, in addition to being uh, having a judicial perspective on uh, and, and making all those legal cases, 
he also wanted to promote world citizenship from a political one. And he ran for mayor of Washington, D.C., for president of the United States on the World Citizen Party platform. He told me a story about how he ran against Marion Barry, the Democrat, and Carol Schwartz, the perennial Republican who always were against each other, on the World Citizen platform, which transcended the Democratic and Republican divide. Gary would talk about how D.C. was a world city, but that it was under threat of nuclear annihilation. He would talk about the level of politics at the city level where mayors would get together and talk about how to improve things. But why not nation states doing that at the national level? And then when the moderator would go to Mary and Barry and, and Carol Schwartz for their reply, they would always have to say, well, we agree with Mr. Davis. <laughs> um, so uh, let me see here. So I don't know if, uh, let me, oops, let me stop the share for a second. Here's another moment where we can talk, but it looks like we may only have five minutes left for me to to share the next few things. So um, you, you, you can take uh, another 10 minutes or so. Okay, okay. Does anyone have a quick comment before I continue? Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, I got a lot, a lot I wanna tell you. Um, well, so Gary, let me share again. Gary, besides the passport, Gary created other tools uh, that would provide an awareness of the one world that we, that we share. One of these was the world money, which he mentioned in my country is the world that he drew on the table for, for someone and handed to him. But he actually created a world kilowatt bill, which he would later call the Mundo like the, the world o, you might say. Um, and money is simply a unit of energy spent or stored. Um, we pay each other for our mind energy or our hand or physical energy to provide service and create things. So Gary created this world kilowatt bill as an alternative to the, to the dollar or other uh, uh, currencies that are linked to war and, and mil military spending. And he said, look, if we link all human beings on a global energy grid so that all the energy is travels around the world, there would be no incentive for one part of the world to bomb another because then your part of the world wouldn't get your electricity the next day. And believe it or not, there actually is a kilowatt cryptocurrency that exists now. Gary also thought that the Mundo would be a good way to prevent bet betting or, or, or trading against a one world currency. Uh, you know, uh, people would come to our office, cab drivers and, and hotel clerks would come to our office to exchange the world kilowatt bill because Gary would pay them in that. Uh, sometimes people would keep it as a memento. But in addition to this, Gary also created um, world postage stamps. And, and this is a way that Gary thought about affirming our right to freedom of expression. Um, but back in the late 1970s, uh, many countries decided to um, uh, have uh, put, put their uh, affiliation or, or di diplomatic relations with mainland China, the People's Republic of China, and no longer Taiwan or the Republic of China. That meant when that happened, a lot of communication between the mainland and Taiwan was, was really hindered. So Gary, I mean, Gary, yeah, Gary created an office in Hong Kong at the time. And what we did is we had people in the mainland send us envelopes uh, that they would be sending to their loves, loved ones in Taiwan, we would repackage it and mail it off to Taiwan and vice versa. People in Taiwan would mail things to our office in Hong Kong and we would pass it along to China. And to cover the fees for this, they would pay for these world postage stamps that we would put on the, the envelopes in addition to the national postage. And this helped maintain communication between the two countries. Gary also um, used uh, the, the funds that came from this to actually help Get, donate money to a, a children's foundation in Switzerland that actually still exists to help uh, provide education assistance to orphaned children from war and, and children in vulnerable situations. So Gary knew the power of symbols, and I won't go through this, but you know about how he talked to children about war, but the symbol of, of the world as one, as seen from outer space, was so important and that he used that as a sim symbol to, to view the world that way. And, you know, and, and the last part of that comment was like, why don't grow up, grown ups just grow up, grow up <laughs> and see the world as, you know, as it really is from outer space. So um, Gary was, there were four elements in the way that Gary was advancing world citizenship and, and also world federal government. Principle, ideology, strategy, and tactics. Principle, the principle is we have one world. There is one humanity and one earth. That's the main principle. The ideology is a code of conduct which you might say is human and environmental rights. It's universal, our universal rights and duties. That's the ideology that we go by, the world citizen ideology. And the strategy is education, speaking at schools, uh, contacting the media. Gary wrote 10 books. Uh, he had a newsletter, a blog, a radio show. He ran for political office, as I mentioned. But there were also other tactics, the symbols, the tools like the passport, like registering people as world citizens, giving them a card to prove it, a uh, world citizen flag, postage stamps, and now our world citizen clubs. For Gary, um, imagination was so important and being resourceful. 
and, and Gary loved to quote Einstein who said, imagination is more important than intelligence. Um, and uh, Gary said, when we create anything, we have to imagine it first. When the Wright brothers created the, the first airplane, they had to imagine it in their mind first they had, uh, before they built it. And imagination is an open and free space. Gary said, when I stepped out of the embassy in Paris, I had to imagine a new world, a legal world, not a world in which I was stateless. I had to create that world in my mind first. Every progress takes imagination first. I imagined the world passport because I needed it. I was stateless. Well, I like to say Gary wasn't stateless. He was world full, meaning he had an awareness of the world as one and humanity as one. Gary had to use his imagination every day to survive outside of the nation state system. But there are 80 million refugees internally and externally displaced. There's 10 million stateless people who are living in a much worse condition than Gary ever did. Um, so that uh, sort of finishes my comments up until the time where um, Gary is, is coming close to you know, his 91st year. So I don't, we, you know, we've got about four minutes left that I have of these comments. So maybe I should finish. And then if there's a little time in between, we'll right afterwards, we'll, we'll keep talking. So, uh, or uh, you know, getting comments from you. So Gary, when Gary was 91, at that point, he really wasn't able to play golf anymore. He used to take two mile walks every day. He couldn't do that. Basically, he was in his home answering emails, uh, keeping his mind busy. Uh, sometimes things were so busy for me at, at the office at WSA that the only time I'd have to talk to him was on my speaker call, speaker phone in my car at the end of the day. And that's when he would tell me his, his dreams, his hopes for humanity. Um, and he was dying from cancer. So he, he told me how he felt too. Uh, Gary, and Gary would say, I cannot not be angry with the war that killed my brother. He, that is still with me. It, it, it comes back whenever I see the wars that are raging in the world. This is why I'm angry and people might get turned off by me, but I don't care if people like me. I want them to open their eyes. This is a question of survival of humanity and the earth. Gary didn't care so much, especially when he got older, what they, you know, what they thought of him. Sometimes he, people might have thought he was angry or annoyed with them. He would raise his voice, uh, but he, he just wanted people to hear him. Um, he thought if he was too friendly, maybe they wouldn't listen to what he was saying. But Gary and I were a good team, sort of bad cop, good cop. He would argue with someone and then I would swoop in and, and explain, well, Gary was mad at you. He's mad at the system that killed his brother and made him kill. Now, just the last couple things that I wanna show you and then we're really almost done here with my comments. Um, so uh, literally about a week before Gary died, um, he said, David, I think we should issue a passport to Edward Snowden, you know, the, the, the person who developed a lot of different secrets uh, about the US government. Uh, so we actually issued this passport. We put on a press release, mailed it out to the Sherem Tievo airport where, where uh, he was hiding out in, in Moscow. Gary was interviewed on CBS Evening News and he talked about the ridiculousness of borders and global justice. So that, later that week, I talked to my parents on the phone and my mom said, said to me, hey, David, you guys should issue a passport to Snowden. She didn't know that we had. And I replied, well, we did already. And then she replied, what? You issued a passport to Snowden? Why would you do that? <laughs> and, and I thought her reply was really what a lot of people thought about Snowden. You know, not sure whether to consider him, consider him a hero or a traitor. Gary is a former bomber pilot in the Air Corps and then a stateless world citizen. He sympathized with Snowden's predicament of sometimes being lauded and other times being lambasted or, or misunderstood. So now I'd like to tell you that my last story. Um, okay, and David, let me tell you, you've got at, mo at most five minutes for your final comments, as well as any comments from the group. Okay, well, should, this should only take me about three minutes. Sure. <laughs> so so um, get, literally um, four days before uh, Gary died, he was going to be picked up by a um, by a, uh, an ambulance to be taken to hospice. And at that point, Gary was using two, two crutches, walking very feebly. Well, so when the, the ambulance driver came to his home, um, and this was uh, on July 19th, 2013, Gary was walking down his front steps with both of his canes, but in one hand, he had a copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as you can see here on the screen. And he handed it to the ambulance driver. And he said to the driver, um, do you know what this is? The driver didn't. And Gary said, this is one of the most important documents in the world. Read it, read it, learn it, share it. If you don't know your rights, you can't claim them. Well, so 
and this is my finally my concluding remarks here. Uh, Gary was a steadfast in his convictions in the understanding of the world. He didn't waver because he was uh, explaining what was self-evident. Um, he was trying to deal with helping us to create a community, uh, human community beyond the anarchy that's clawing at our heels. He was creative uh, in the techniques that he used to change the world. Some might have seen that as selfish or stubborn, but I see it as dedication to being, embodying, or performing peace, to creating the tools that allow us to understand the world is already one. And Gary did this throughout his life. We must individually speak out on behalf of humanity. He was a gifted storyteller, a Broadway actor, an unflinching activist, an unceasing optimist, a spiritual human being, and he was a world citizen. He was also an architect, building the legal structures that bear witness to the one peaceful world that exists, but that we humans often fail to recognize. That fun excitement and sometimes trepidation that I felt working with Gary have only convinced me more that Gary's human rights activism and his promotion of world citizenship and world law are key to dealing with the global crises that are facing humanity and the earth. And now I'd like to give Gary the last word. The world is one, we're living in it, we are it, we're the world citizens, and you've got to claim it, okay? And we'll make world peace together. There you go. <laughs> Great. Th thank you, David, for, for the, all those wonderful stories. That, that was really great. Um, we do have a couple of minutes if anyone who wants to speak might make a comment uh, to do so. And we'll start with people who haven't spoken before. So I see uh, Bob, Bob uh, Anisha, and David Orton. Bob, you got to go on mute. Um, okay, I just wanted to ask one question. Uh, whether uh, Gary Davis ever did anything about the problem of concentration of wealth. Yeah, he, we, he worked with some economists on ESOPs, uh, employee stock ownership programs, and said that we, the people, should own corporations, not you know, the 1%. So that was you know, an economic plan within the world citizen party platform, you might say, was important to him. Uh, you know, the, the, the um, conglomeration of power into, into the hands of the few, uh, whether it's national leaders or corporate leaders is a problem. So yeah, definitely that was part of the work. And he wrote about that. Gary, you know, Gary not only wrote the 10 books, but he, we had our newsletter. He was always writing, writing op-eds. So he got the word out, you know, in many different ways. Great, thank you. Uh, Anisha. Um, thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for this very nice, excellent presentation, Mr. David. What I want to say that um, many people don't know about this concept of uh, one world, one Air Force, one um, citizenship, one world citizenship. So um, I saw um, in a picture, we have one world institute. So we can promote uh, our concept through MOOCs massive open online courses, which will be free for everyone. And we can promote our concept um, because we need to trick our social system um, by two-way application of UDHR that I clarified in my book. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yes. Thank you, Anisha. Yeah. And last but not least, David Orton. Uh, David, two quick questions. First, do you, because of uh, Gary's influence on you, do you have you given up your U.S. passport? And secondly, do you think national governments have any right to regulate immigration? I've not given up my U.S. passport. I carry both. Uh, Gary did say I should go to jail, though. My wife doesn't agree with that. Um, <laughs> so so uh, I did not. But his point was that you don't have to give up any other allegiance. You just have to have that higher allegiance, that higher awareness, because the lower ones are not a problem. The, it's the problem, the anarchy between the states that's the problem, not the states themselves. We want to celebrate nation states and all our cultural or ethnic or other identities and protect them. That means we need to be beyond them. Um, and then uh, what was your second question? 
Do national governments well, have any right to regulate immigration? Well, they don't have a right. They have a power. <laughs> Once again, they have a power to regulate. Um, and you know, certainly in times of pandemics, like if I were to tell, to some, tell somebody over the phone who calls about our world passport, I would say, look, really the only times that someone should not be able to exercise a right to freedom of travel is like for health and safety, like we're living through now, or if someone has harmed somebody or will potentially harm somebody. Other than that, as a human being, you should be able to travel free, freely on your own planet. That's never existed, even in ancient times when passwords didn't exist. You still had to be wealthy. You still had to know the king or, or whatever. You still had to be able to have the you know, physical materials to build a boat or something to go somewhere. So we've never really had uh, full freedom. And I would see that we would have to have sort of a, a world federal government uh, that would then resolve any of the lower level issues like immigration. It wouldn't be an issue any world, uh, anymore if the world worked for everyone. You could go wherever you wanted to, just like you go from Indiana to Illinois right now. Great. Thank you. And thank you again, David, for sharing those wonderfully rich stories and, um, and just how unique it must have been uh, to be in partnership for years um, with such a unique man. Uh, so thank you for all that. Um, I, I, wa I, wanted, I, I wanted to say building on that, that in addition to learning about World Federation and uh, promoting World Federation and global citizenship, the other purpose of this book club is to see what we could learn that we could bring back to either CGS or any organization you might be connected with. So I don't know how many of you were at our conference uh, recently and particularly the last presentation uh, on the last day where Shimri Zemret um, actually spoke to this. So I asked Shimri if he could um, share with me his, um, his PowerPoint, his slides that I could share with all of you, because he used Gary Davis as an example of a particular strategy for movement building that he was suggesting that we as the World Federalist Movement adopt. Um, so I'm not gonna go through his entire slideshow, uh, but I will show you the two or three slides and explain the point that he was making. So if you give me a minute to push a button or two, uh, I will do that and then get those slides up on the screen. Please I had a question. Up. Did you see it in the, I raised my hand. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get you right after then. Um, so pardon me a moment. Um, I was also going by the time. Uh, we were running out of time, but That's hold on. That's what I was going to ask about. What's the rush? I could the barely hear we... David. He was talking so fast. What's yeah. the hurry? Do you can do another Zoom and another, you know, if you've got a limit on the time of Zoom. Um, yes, we could do another meeting. Uh, th th that is correct. And we'll decide if we need to do that. But in the meantime, um, we, we are following a schedule for this meeting. So if you please bear with me, I will, um, I will go ahead and share. Hold on a second. Okay, got that one. Okay, do you all see um, the, uh, the uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great, good. All right, so um, getting right to um, Shimri's slide, what he uh, talked about was he said that, um, it, he started off with a, an analysis of power. And he said that power is usually viewed as something flowing from the top. Uh, we have certain, um, you know, we, there, are, there are leaders, there are people that hold power, and we usually view it as flowing down from the top. But he said that an alternative view that's used by some activists, uh, kind of a particular school of thought, is that we have all these pillars of society. Uh, we have local governments, public opinion, the media, faith groups, et cetera, et cetera, that actually give power to the power holders on top. So he, he started with that point, and then he said the idea is to disrupt those pillars. So he gave the example as he was moving toward Gary Davis of the Freedom Riders um, who did their, you know, went down to Mississippi um, in, you know, during the civil, height of the civil rights movement, deliberately to disrupt and to get arrested. And what then happens, you know, according to this model, is once you do that sort of thing, you get a lot of public attention. And then your movement, you know, people then find out about you, 
the, they come to your movement and then the term that they use is absorption. You absorb those people into your movement and that begins to build momentum. So the uh, model that Shimri uh, proposed is, is shown by this cycle where you have um, essentially this dramatization where you do something to dramatize uh, an injustice or a problem in the world that then disrupts um, the, the status quo. Public opinion begins to shift. People come to you, you absorb those people. That's the, the, the third picture there. And then you continue the cycle. And, uh, and, he's, and Shimri said that, that Gary Davis is a wonderful example. He did this time and time again. And from the film you saw, you know, disrupting the proceedings at the UN, which was just forming, getting all that attention. People, thousands or tens of thousands of people from around the world writing in, I want to be a world citizen, and then him absorbing them by registering them as world citizens. So, so he was suggesting that that's something the World Federalist Movement should be doing uh, in, its, um, in its strategy, which we typically have not done. Uh, we have done public education, we've done lobbying, we've done a number of things, but we haven't actually done this kind of disruption tactic and then, and then getting media attention from it and absorbing those people into the movement. So I'll just put that out as something that um, kind of a, a critique or analysis of uh, from a movement building standpoint of what Gary Davis was doing. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and if uh, open the floor for comments either on that or any comments that remain uh, from, you know, from David's talk. Um, and then we'll move into the last part of deciding on the next book or books. So let me begin with whoever spoke up a moment ago uh, who didn't get a chance to talk. Lynn? Yeah, um, I just um, was curious why the rush? Well, I always talk fast. <laughs> That's a problem for me. But. Yeah, but if there's stuff that you missed, I want to hear it. I don't care how long it takes. <laughs> right. Well, we, is we, a, we, is we, a we, universal, we, you know, it's a like a federal issue. What, who's the time, what's the purpose of the time limit? Right. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're saying, but, but uh, let, let me just say that, uh, that a lot of attention goes into planning the agenda and the schedule, and we try to keep to it once we send it out. If it turns out that things need more attention, we could always, as you said, add additional sessions. Right. Um, are, so you're limited to it, a, a Zoom session, is that? No, th th this is an ongoing book club that meets every month that has a certain agenda. Uh, and, and a certain protocol. We've been doing this for several years. Right, so we don't we, have a Zoom limitation. No, no, oh. we don't have a Zoom limitation, but we, we, I, I, we, when we plan these, we assume that we need to let people, we need to adjourn the meeting and let people go back, go back to their lives and the other things they scheduled for the day. So we don't uh, go over the time that we set because then people get upset <laughs> that they've got to go on to their other things. Yeah, you want to honor everybody's time. That's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, well, okay. I think you need to make your meeting longer, it seems like to me, because there's a lot of good information that's being lost um, oh. and life's short. Um, I wanted to bring up water futures were, are being sold on, on the, I, guess, I don't know if it's the US stock exchange as of yesterday. And um, I also wanted to, uh, that's never happened before. And I also wanted to know how his father got killed or his brother got killed. So yeah, Gary's brother was killed on his battleship in Salerno, Italy. It was just basically his battleship was blown up. During the war, during, during the World, war, during war, during II. World war II. Yeah, during World War II, sorry, yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I saw a few hands if you would put them up again in front of the um, screen. Ar Arthur kind of gets his. Arthur's yeah. up electronically. Yeah. I'll call on people who have not yet been called on. So Arthur, go ahead. And we need to get to picking the next book momentarily. Yeah. Go ahead, Arthur. I just want to say that, David, you did an extraordinary job 
I mean, I knew I've known Gary for 25 years, and I learned so much listening to your stories and so many more things. So bravo, bravo, David. Um, and uh, also just to add, you know, this is just a crucial time now to be getting Gary's story out to the world. And we're so pleased that we will be having a public television broadcast sent out by NETA in April. Uh, anyone who, who wants to can go to theworldismycountry.com slash public TV and sign up to hear more about it, to help, to pitch in, to let others know, to become sponsors, to do other things to get Gary's absolutely crucial story out to the world. And I, I do hope the book club will, uh, you know, some great new books that were recommended, that you recommended, Bob, three books, but I hope we'll also circle back to some of Gary's other books, of the other 10 books that he wrote as well. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Beautiful job. Great. Terrific. Thank you. Is there anyone who hasn't yet spoken who would like to speak? Let's see if, if there are any of those folks first. Okay, seeing none, is there anybody else who's already spoken who wants to make a final comment? Okay, Bob Reinhold, take yourself off mute. Bob, you're still on mute. Yeah, Bob, your lips are moving, but you're still on mute. We can't hear you. I'm surprised that uh, the only issue that he ever raised regarding concentration of wealth was to support ESOPs, which is employee stock ownership uh, plans. Uh, and th that still does not deal very successfully with any concentration of wealth. Uh, I wonder if you would, you do suggest that you support disruptive tactics. It seems to me a disruptive tactic is in order right now for people to raise a lot of hell with the very wealthy of this country, the, especially the billionaires who have had a profit of trillions of dollars since the beginning of the pandemic. And people are now starving in this country and other parts of the world. And people are being uh, evicted from their uh, uh, houses. Businesses are being shut down. In other words, the wealthy have gotten wealthier and the poor are in a desperate strait increasingly. Don't you think that something should be done, a disruptive tactic, to do something about this? Okay, I'm gonna, Bob, I'm gonna have to leave that, that as a comment. We have about eight minutes to go. Two more people have their hands up and we need to pick the next couple of books. So uh, we're already over time. So I just leave that in the air as a comment right now, rather than a discussion. Um, I see, I'll take Donna and then Lynn, and then we'll move to pick the next book. I just want to say that anyone who wants to continue discussing the movie, I know that this coming Thursday, the Minnesota chapter is having a session. I will send out an email to the book club, uh, Google group about it in case anyone wants to continue discussing it in that form. Great, thank you, Donna. Okay, Lynn, you'll have the last and word. Really quick, I have in my calendar that there's a noon meeting of CGS. Is that just that I got the um, Eastern time, I'm on mountain time. Uh, yes, I, I just put the Eastern time on and you know trust that other people can figure out what that means in whatever time. Yeah. Is noon. So I just, there's not another one at noon. No. Okay, just to check, thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, Gail, let me ask you, um, did you want me to keep rolling and go and, and talk about the next book or did you wanna jump in and take that part? And I apologize for leaving so little time. Um, I'll just comment that I sent everybody the list of Bob's three priorities. And I also um, sent information that Ron uh, responded in terms of the order in which he thought these books might most effectively be read. Um, there was another, I, I proposed a book, this one, COVID-19, The Great Reset. And Melanie was enthusiastic about this book. I just got it yesterday, by the way, in the mail. Um, but Bob reminded me that um, we had two different um, categories that he had proposed from the previous meeting. And um, it didn't fit either the 
uh, classic world government as a whole or uh, particular strategies were the two categories. So um, anyway, we no, will no, not- no, Gail, 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 let me just correct that. Um, the, 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 this is the only book club in the world devoted to World Federation and global citizenship. So uh, it, it, that, that manifests the purpose of this organization. So rather than open it up to anything about whether it's COVID related economics or whatever, this is the only place in the world where you can come for that information. And for people who wanna learn about that, we direct them here uh, within well, the world. I, I, agree, I agreed with you, you know, I'm, I'm withdrawing the book, but the reason why I thought it might be appropriate is because it's written by Klaus Schwab who founded the World Economic Forum, which is a global Understood. organization. So, I mean, it depends Understood. on the definition of, of global federation and world government because it is, I mean, that, that's, that was my thinking about it anyway. So, Understood. So, um, then I trust everybody has the three books that, uh, and I'm thinking instead of picking the, just the next two books, since Bob suggested three and Ron liked those three too, what do people think about picking the next three books? Name the three books. Um, Emery Revis, um, The Anatomy of Peace. By the way, all these books are available through Amazon quite inexpensively and probably other sources too. Mortimer Adler's How to Think About War and Peace. Um, oh, the Revis book was written in 1945. The Adler book was written in 1996. And then Tettleman and Bellatzos, 2005, One World Democracy, A Progressive Vision for Enforceable Global Law. And these have been, in, in, they've influenced numbers of people in our group. And so that's why, um, and they're, very, they're kind of classic books. Yes, David? I'd like to propose another one um, because I think the Revis book and the Adler book are extremely important, but um, you know, uh, they, those two people are no longer alive. What I would propose is one of the books by Glenn Martin on a world constitution because he spoke at our uh, convention and I think it would be great to have him monitor uh, his book uh, while he's still alive. Agreed. Is it available um, through Amazon? I'm just yes, he, he, he's a prolific writer and most of his books are available. It was on, um, a, 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 his book or one, of, one or several was on the original list that I sent out of a number of different ones. And then I, I just picked among those. Let me, let me just let people know that um, we open the floor to anybody making suggestions when, um, so I made mine, no one added additional suggestions right. uh, on World Federation books. So, and then when um, th we, we were asked the second time to narrow them down, I, m I made my three suggestions, no one else did, but Ron Glossip suggested the order, he agreed with those books, suggested the order we read them in. So, and I'm certainly happy with adding Glenn Martins to the to the mix. Are there other nominations for books? That is for the next round of rounds. Yeah, I think we already called for nominations and there were no. <laughs> okay, so. Um, um, how do we proceed in, in regards to um, deciding? We, we've got four books now proposed. All of them sound great. <laughs> would anybody like to uh, propose? What? Yeah. I, I would suggest we do Glenn's first for just the reason that was mentioned uh, and because he's so vital to talk about it. And, you know, uh, obviously uh, Anatomy of Peace would be fantastic, but since it's uh, <coughs> over 70 years old, we can hold off on that a little bit. I would love to do. Uh, Glenn Martin first. And Glenn Martin will be our guest on the People Power Planet podcast. Uh, Melanie, is it uh, January 20th, I believe, right? I'll write it in the chat. Yeah, it, two of those four books have living authors. So we can put those two first and invite the authors, which we've tried to do in the past between, you know, uh, 
you know, Ron's book, um, um, uh, oh God, so Veda's book. So we can go for the living authors first and then do the other ones. If I see a number of heads shaking, yes. does, does anybody not like that strategy? Uh, we have had a book by Soveda um, previously that we right. Discussed. That's what I said. We we, right, we, right. we had her. You know, she was a living author. Yeah, yeah. So who is the other li living author? The uh, Tiedelman Balitzos book. Are both Tiedelman and Balitzos alive? Or correct. Yes. <laughs> the last time I talked to them, they were very much alive. <laughs> What's the name of Glenn Martin's book again? Oh, he has a whole bunch of them. Um, I'll just hold them. Well, which is the up. one that Dave, what's the one Dave Otten suggested? Dave suggested. Well, no? Oh, I thought you Probably one, one of these two. He's written many. Yeah. Yeah. David, is it World Constitution that you have particularly in mind? Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah they're, 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 these two are very equivalent. We need to see which one gives more context. Um, this is his book on the environment. Uh, by the way. And then um, this is one, I think his uh, uh, very esoteric book is, this might be his newest one. So he's a very prolific author. Yeah. But I have a suggestion. Why don't we take both? Well, we wanted to pick um, two in fact because that way it's more efficient. We can plan ahead. So yeah. we could decide that yes. we want these yes, but, the next two books. But we, but we can take both to decide that. Yeah, that's what we do. We, we, we're picking two at a yes. time. Yeah. So why don't we do this for efficiency? Um, we'll contact the living authors, see who's available uh, to participate and we can go that way. And then with the other two, uh, and Ron's suggestion is we take them chronologically uh, so they kind of make sense with, with how they work. So when we're done with the first two books, we can revisit this and see if people still want to do that with the next two books or if something jumped on the radar screen that we should also consider at that time. How is that for a plan for moving forward? Well, I would think, Glenn, we don't even have to contact. We know he's available. He wants to be doing this. And I think we could go ahead and maybe do his book first, I would suggest. Uh, I have no But nobody picked one of his books. I mean, there's a whole list of them, so. Well, let, let's start with the Earth Constitution, I think, because I think we all need to know the fundamental document yeah. that they're talking about. Wouldn't you think that book to start with? Yeah, he, he has two or three that are kind of the broad overview books. And I need to look at them and see which one is the broadest in a sense. So some of them are more, for, there's one that is just the earth constitution. There's one that gives a supplement and more information. So we can, we can just look at that offline and see which one would be the broadest one to use. Okay. So Bob, would you um, be willing to do that then to give us yeah, a no, I, I could handle that. Yeah, they're similar, but some are better than others. Okay, so we're, we're three minutes over, Gail. I don't know um, what you want to do to close it. There are hands. <laughs> um, so we picked the Glenn Martin, Martin, whichever book is broadest as our next book. And after that, the Tettleman and Belitzos book, um, if either of them or both of them are available. Yeah. And yeah, it's not- Tettleman, Tettleman's available too. He, he comes to our podcast each Wednesday. And in fact, this Wednesday we have a terrific a speaker on kind of the yeah. mechanism of global citizenship. So yeah, I think yeah. he's available. Uh, yeah. he, he's on our social media team. He's available. He's already yeah. working with us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, now we also have a parable that uh, that Dave Gallup wanted to give us to close. Oh, oh, the next date, by the way, is January 9 is the second Saturday in January, a month from today. Does that give us enough time to read the next book, or do we want to skip a month? Well, we skip all you got to do is read a chapter <laughs> or two. I mean, that's, you know. Okay. I'd go with January 9th. Did somebody put out on the internet a list of these books? Because I'm not familiar with some of them. Just a list on the internet so we could pick it up. Um, I have tried sending the list before, a longer list, and then the three books that Bob um, gave priority to 
is in the last email that I sent. And um, the other one by Glenn Martin will be added. Yeah. Okay, so, so um, January 9th, same time, same place. Okay. From and and Gail, Gail Barat has been waving his hand for a oh, while. Sorry. sorry, Barat? Yeah, I just wanted to suggest that if you're going to go with Glenn Martin, I did see his presentation at the conference, and it'll be good for the book club to see that presentation where he covers uh, the ideas in his books, you know, uh, in a way summarizes them fairly well. Yes. So that's just a yeah. suggestion. We'll send out the link to the recording yeah, today. Maybe that that's recorded. I don't think that was recorded. Yes, it was. Yeah, we yeah. will send that. We will send out the link to okay. that. Okay. Well, good. I I didn't find it. So. By the way, oh. I want to announce that Anesha. Um, Kargupta wrote a book which has just been published and she is sending us her PDF book um, version for free. So I will send that to you right at the end of this meeting. So everybody will have access to that. Congratulations, Vanessa. Uh, how, how many days are we, Thank you. how many meetings are we gonna have on the first book? One, one meeting, three the, meetings? Not, 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 not clear yet, that, that has to be discussed. Okay. We don't know which book um, it will be even. Yeah. So we, we will sort it out. <laughs> Bob will make the recommendation <laughs> for us. So David Gallup, do you want to close with the parable? Sure. This is um, David. This yes. I had a quick thing first. Um, I I wanted to see um the the slide of the stamps. I couldn't, it went by so fast I couldn't see it closely. What, what I'd like to do is if I can get your email, I'll email it to you. So then you um, can like take a long time to look at it <laughs> if that's okay um yeah i just put it in the chat email. put it in the chat yeah it's just, they here's, charge they charge for email um well here's my email or 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 we can have a zoom separately sometime and i'll uh you and just you and me and i can tell you more okay? yeah it just went by too fast i wanted to look just for a second sure. a little closer yeah. Um, There's also on our website, I think they, they're displayed on our website, worldservice.org also, if you want to take a look. Uh, so anyway, well, so this is a, a very brief parable <laughs> um, about the thief and the guru. And Gary, at, at some points in his life, was a guru. And even as you know, uh, he was a thief, at least a thief to be able to be put into the civic system so he could try to stay in France. But one day, Gary said to me, David, a guru is worth a hundred thieves. A guru is worth a hundred thieves. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm like, Gary, what do you mean? Why are you telling me that a guru is worth a hundred thieves? But like his gurus before him, he said, okay, David, I'll tell you why a guru is worth a hundred thieves. So he shared more details. He said, one person of heart, which you can't see, here's my heart. One person of heart is worth a hundred people of head. One thief is worth a hundred people of heart, and one guru is worth a hundred thieves. So my eyes were wide open, I was confused, and so Gary explained that a person of heart, that is a person of action, someone who acts from emotion. And so a person of heart is worth a hundred people of head, because the person of head might have a lot of great thoughts, but maybe they'll never take any action on those thoughts. Nothing may change, because all the thoughts just stay in their head. But now the problem with the person of heart is that they may not have thought through their actions. So their actions may have little impact. Um, and this is what brings us to the thief. One thief is worth a hundred people of heart because the thief, if they're a successful thief, will have taken painstaking efforts to plan their theft. And because they're a thief, they're willing to go through with it, uh, even if they might get caught. So the thief has put the head and the heart together to take action to steal something. But the thief is in the perceptual world, bound by space and time. The thief is in the here and now, and they are in the material or relative world. So the thief is selfish. They're really only for themselves. They only want to get something for themselves. And now this brings us to the guru. Why is a guru worth 100 thieves? Well, because the guru puts the head and the heart together in an ethical framework for understanding the world around them. The guru is in the conceptual world or the world of values. The guru is a teacher and gives to others. The guru is for others. The guru is selfless. 
There, the guru is free and has no karma. And the guru has found the truth and is one with the truth. The guru sees the world holistically and everything as one. So the guru is worth a hundred thieves because they think about their actions before they take them uh, to make sure that those actions will actually help people. And then they're sure to act. Now, what does this parable of the guru and the thief, you know, why a guru is worth a hundred thieves, what does that have to do with our work uh, as world federalists and world citizens? Well, I would say we need to think and act like the guru. We need to let our thoughts provide logic and guidance to our actions. And we need to let our emotions, um, our heart, empower purposefulness in our thoughts. Well, so what is the biggest obstacle to creating a world federal government and for everybody seeing themselves as world citizens? I would say it's the difficulty of getting into people's hearts and into people's minds. It's the, the pathos and the logos. So we must use ethos or the ethical power of world federation and world citizenship to capture people's hearts and their minds. But the head is up here and the, the heart is down there. How do we find the middle ground between the, the head and the heart like the guru has? Well, the Greek poet Hesiod said everything should be done in moderation. So where do we find that middle ground between the, the head and the heart? Well, what's, the, what's between the head and heart? Right here, the neck. This is where and how we get into people's hearts and minds because it's in our neck, that is where we have our voice, right? That's where our voice comes from. And it is our voice that we can use to share our thoughts and to share our, our feelings. And it is our voice that can help us achieve world peace. Great, thank you so much, David. I, I want to invite uh, David, if you have the time to join Gail and I just to debrief after sure. the meeting. Sure. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Bye. 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 Okay. Yeah, we got a little loose there at the end. <laughs> Your agenda was a little overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was too much. I, well, the problem is I've never done this before. So I didn't know whether it was gonna take the 50 minutes that I had allotted. I guess I should have allotted like an hour and 15 minutes really to have both questions and comments in it. And so that I could slow down and get to the, really the heart of the matter of, of all the different stories, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, well. Time aside, how how was it for you, David? Oh, I loved this. This was really fun yeah. for me. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I spent a long time preparing <laughs> preparing this. I when I suggested this three months ago or four months ago, I didn't realize how long it would take for me not only to think about all the sort of stories, and there were, and of course, there's more, uh, and but then to actually go and try to find pictures of Gary. And I've told you both this before that we're at least the world citizenship movement it was such a heavy, heavily written movement of words and not as much of pictures and that's what made yeah. it really difficult and frustrating for me to find you know slides to present that would link to what i was saying so that was a frustrating part for me yeah. which is why we need an archive <laughs> yeah 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 and gail what about you how was it from your vantage point yeah, I think people seem to be involved and interested. Uh, there were some people who did not participate at all. Um, maybe that's because the time was so packed. They, you know, they might have thought of things to say, um, but anyway, they they didn't. But that didn't mean that they weren't involved. Great. Yeah, for myself, David, I I think you did a great job. First of all, and, and I have to say. You know, when I plan stuff, I, I always um, kind of underestimate the amount of time it would take, you know, because when you get into, even if I rehearse it and I time it, whatever, it, I don't know why, it inevitably takes longer when you're explaining something because you realize there's another nuance that you want to clarify, another qualification you want to throw in. 
So yeah, it's just really hard, you know? I mean, usually it takes me kind of three times of doing something till I kind of perfect it and know how long it takes and what I need to do and all that stuff. So yeah, so I thought you did great and that, that just comes with the territory. I, I think we have to get a little bit better, um, you know, with the, well, I mean, uh, you know, like at the end when we were trying to pick a book and, and uh, that woman came in and said, why are you in a rush? And we should just, you know, I, I kind of was a little thrown for a loop. I didn't know how to, how to respond at the moment. And uh, I didn't even know what she meant, you know, but I, I guess she thought this is just like an ongoing discussion that could last for hours or something. Um, unless she was confused by the time. I think that was um, yeah. Maybe that I, was it. I do always give the time frame that is from noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And there was another question about Eastern time. So, but if, if I put all the times every time that I find that can be confusing yeah. too, so. Yeah, no, I, I thought the time thing, uh, both of those questions came from her, I thought. Oh. That, uh, yeah, that she was, so maybe she just thought it, it was still going for another hour. Why are you rushing? Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, okay. she's on mount, she was on mountain time. So she yeah. thought that maybe this was an additional meeting after this. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I got it. Um, so, yeah, because I was a little, you know, I didn't, I just didn't know what she meant, you know. <laughs> and then I, I, I like when Melanie came in and just said, we want to respect everyone's time. That was so and nice. all that stuff, so. God. All right. So, um, so yeah, no, I thought it was great. And, and I'll take a look at those two uh, Glenn Martin books uh, that, you know, the two that cover the most basic um, part and, and also if they're both available um, and all that. So uh, yeah, but look, if, if we end up getting the next four books out of this conversation, it was well worth it. You okay. know? So, yeah, the reason um, why I mentioned the um, the Great Reset book is because Melanie did respond to me, um, but she she was very enthusiastic about that book. So I wanted to right. give people an explanation as to why I was withdrawing the, that nomination. So. No, no, I I, I understand, but, but you you, you, you the, the reason I came in, I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm very sensitive to being misquoted, um, and, and and sometimes too so. So you were saying that um, what you said was that I, I, I came in, I, I commented on it because it wasn't one of these two kinds of World Federation books, okay? That's not what I said. Um, I said it's because it wasn't about World Federation or global citizenship. That was the reason. And, that's, and that makes it align with our mission. And my, jo my, my job is to protect the mission I came in a little strong because I was already a little, um, you know, rushed with the time, and I, I mean, I apologize, um, you know, for that. But the, um, but it, it was my button about being misquoted, coupled with the fact that we had like a minute left, and and I, I was, I wanted to push this and get it done. I'm sorry. Yeah, but pl please, if you wanted to say something else about that. No, I just wanted uh, to explain why I ra why I raised the book again at all. Yeah, I, I was thinking maybe you thought I was trying to push it, and that's not that. I was trying to just explain why that was not why it was taken off of the list. Right. Uh, no, I, I I do. I mean, I got that from what you were saying. Okay. And and, and I I didn't misunderstand. Yeah. yeah. So um, so all right. Well, anything else to wrap up for now? Okay, great. It turns out that I have a neighbor who knows you, Bob. Linda oh. Rust. Oh, yeah. We went to high school together. From years ago? Yeah. She yeah, high school. You were um, um, involved in some leadership development program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I was involved with the student government, and I, I put together a leadership program. It was, I forgot what it was called, but it was in, in, the, in, in our high school. It was a leadership program. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, so hello from, from her. Um, oh, cool. And, we'll uh, say hello back. I will. Yeah. She lives lives just a few blocks from me, and uh, so anyway. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we emailed a couple of years ago, and somehow we bumped into each other, or maybe Facebook or whatever. Uh -huh. Oh, definitely say hello for me. That that's very funny. That, that's very funny. Wow. So. Um, 
All right. Well, again, I, I apologize, Gail. We, we, we um, I mean, we, yeah, it was just, you know, there was so much richness in, in, in um, you know, in, in David's presentation. I was trying to keep, keep recalculating of how much can we squeeze down the, um, you know, both what I was going to say and the book club part. And then that really jammed everything at the end. Yeah, I'm sorry, you know? Bob and Gail, but the, I didn't. Yeah, no, well, it, it was. It worked the, out. You know, sorry. Yeah, no, no one did anything wrong. It was just the, the way it turned out. Yeah, yeah. We went over by only six minutes, I think. Well, that's not too bad. Yeah. Um, I, I saw more like 14. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. When I looked up, it was like 14, 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And then I felt bad going over, um, you know, after having told Lynn, we're trying to not go over, you know. And so I, I, was, I was doing a lot of internal adjusting. Uh, to try to make it work for me in, internally, subjectively. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, we just got to get better at that. So, uh, do, do either of you know Lynn? I know I've seen her name, but I don't know anything about her. She was on a couple of calls. Um, I don't remember exactly which yeah. one. Because then when she made the comment, you wanted to send her um, that slide, David, and she said it costs money to send the slide and all it's like you know yeah, email i don't know what she meant by email yeah costs money so yeah you know, i don't know all right <laughs> all right well she's hooked on to us yeah so all right well blessings to all of you have a fabulous weekend you too thank um, you so much and we'll see you uh in this in this form next year maybe we'll see you before next year but in this form we'll see you next year excellent okay okay take care Happy New Year. all righty <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.